crossroads of the Ozarks. Greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship Bible Study for Sunday, February February 12th, 2023. <laughs> now I'm messing up this time. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. This is take two of our study. <laughs> it's why we don't do it live. That's why we don't do it live. Welcome to this uh, the f- fellowship. And you know, on Tuesday, it's going to be Valentine's Day. And Derek and I often say this to each other. It doesn't have to be a special day of the year to celebrate some sort of sp- special bond between us. Mm-hmm. Because honestly, every day of the year is amazing and wonderful, and you make it special. Well, and and you do too. Every day is an adventure. Mm -hmm. Um, It is, in over 25 years, we'd be not in completely truthful if we said that every day was a wonderful, joyous day. There most are, some are days where, But most are. I and can count on one hand the number of days that have been, right. you know, sort of trials. But uh, look, every marriage has those, and the Lord has helped us very quickly within mm-hmm. the course of a day, usually, or less, to get through whatever disagreement or di- misunderstanding. And, and use agriculture as a metaphor. Without that rain, you don't appreciate the sunny days quite so much. If There's, it's sun every day, uh, that that becomes that that's not healthy either. That is so true. But you know, not that we you look have for given conflict, me twenty five um, years yeah. of almost every day sunny. So thank you, thank you, thank you for well, that. And and thank you, sweetheart. And that's really the way it ought to be because otherwise, if those days like birthdays, Valentine's Day, whatever, become tests. Mm. That just makes it worse. It's like it's stressful. I've, I've been there, you know, where well, it's like, if, if, you don't, if you don't pass the test on Valentine's Day, then you pay the price. I know, and it doesn't there. have, to, doesn't have to be a marriage. There are couples that right, are just right. dating that, for whatever reason, that's the big test. Now, it, it, you have to love each other every, right. every day, just as the Lord loves us every, every day. Absolutely. Boy. Howdy. Well, there's a lesson. But, you know, speaking of Valentine's Day. <laughs> Guys, just a pro tip. A candy purchased at the gas station. Not a good idea any day of the gas year. Gas station flowers, Gas not station so much. flowers, not so much. No, yeah. not just so a, much. Just a, just a tip. But here's the thing. Treat your wife every day like she's special. Well, that's it. That's it. Treat your husband every day like he's special. Because that's the other thing, too. If those things only happen on those days, mm-hmm. then, it's, then it's like, well... Big whoop. You're only doing this because it's February 14th. Could be, yeah. yeah. Interesting thing about February 14th, though, and this is something I think you've gotten into with Dr. Judd Burton, our good friend. Yes. And that is that it's really an echo of an ancient tradition called mm-hmm. the Februalia, mm-hmm. which also is creepy. The Lupercalia. Yes, exactly, because yeah. it's really, really creepy. They would take, they would sacrifice, the men of Rome would sacrifice a goat. Mm-hmm. And they would uh, smear themselves with blood, and then they would take the strips of the goat hide and go and flail mm-hmm. women as they ran. They circumvented the hill. Circumnavigated. Anti- circumna- mm-hmm. Well, yeah, circumnavigated the hill. They walked around it right. Anti-clock- counterclockwise, mm-hmm. anti-clockwise. Um, I write so much British stuff that anti-clockwise is my go-to anymore instead of counter, <laughs> the way we say here in America. But uh, they, they went around it the opposite way of the clock, mm-hmm. just the way many pagan rituals are anti-clockwise. Yes. Yes. And we can trace that back to uh, Mount Hermon and, you know, other practices that continue to this day that attract Millions. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, yeah, this is just an echo of that. Does it mean that if you give your loved one a card or whatever on on February 14th that you're no, it doesn't mean that it Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that at all. But that's the roots of almost everything in society has pagan root. True. I mean, even down to the wedding bands that Mm -hmm. many of us Christians wear proudly on our hands. I'm proud to wear my ring. Sure. Na- names of the months. They're, they're all pagan if we start down that path of yeah. purging everything that's got a pagan origin. Yeah. But do yeah. what the Lord does. He kept taking everything back. Exactly. Reclaiming it for himself. Yeah. So when we celebrate Christmas. Take it back. Yeah. We're taking it back. One time of the year we can mention his name without... Uh, Praise yeah. the Lord We're, God Almighty, but the public. enemy, you know, yeah. he wants he doesn't want us to do that. Well, right. today we've got some really interesting reading right yeah. off the bat. We do, we do. And, just a, and just a reminder, before we get too far and before we go all mm-hmm. to the Bible, let us remember that Derek and I have the GHTV app, the Gilbert House right. app, mm-hmm. that you can download for free at gilberthouse.org slash app. 
and it's on just about every mobile device. It's mm -hmm. also on Roku and Apple TV, and you will get to enjoy all of the stuff we produce. You will be so sick of us right. for free. Absolutely, at no cost to you. Yeah. Except perhaps your sanity, which <laughs> well, is, that's a... <laughs> if you're downloading the app, you yeah. know, one might question that right off the bat. <laughs> but you can find it at the uh, Apple Store, the Google Play Store, but we, we to make it easy, we've got links to those stores at gilberthouse.org slash app. Yep. Do try to make it easy. And after the study at the very end, we're going to tell you once again, if you've missed it, we're going to tell you once again how you can build barn better. Mm. Open with a word of prayer. Let's do. Thank you, Father, for bringing us together over your word. We ask you to help us as we study to understand it to the best of our ability. We know, Lord, that um, we don't have the worldview of 3,000 years ago, but to the best of our ability and, uh, and through our study, help us to understand your words the way David understood them, the way your prophets understood them, to see the spirit realm and the conflict there clearly. We pray for wisdom, Lord, every day that we, as we study, would add nothing to your word. Don't help us not to read into your word, but to take only from your word that which you would have us learn. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love that. By the way, those of you who have asked about Dr. Michael Heiser, mm -hmm. he is still very, very, very sick and at home on hospice. Yeah. We're, there have been some erroneous reports out there about his... Uh, about his condition at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, no, and we've been in touch with, with Drina Heiser. Right. So, um, as of yesterday, as of yesterday. So we are confident in, in our information. Mm -hmm. We so are, we continue to pray for Mike and his family and, um, there are opportunities to be of assistance. They've got a, uh, it's not a GoFundMe. It's a, it's a ministry called meal train where you basically pay for a, a group to prepare and deliver meals mm -hmm. to families in this situation. I, I mean, that's, that. That, that really is a wonderful way of ministering to a family in this situation because preparing meals is about the last thing you want to think about mm -hmm. when you're a family member attending to a, a loved one. Exactly. Yeah, so. she's got other things to think about. So pray for the Heisers, pray for Narina and, and the kids and also for Mike. Um, you know, he is in the Lord's hands. What a wonderful place to be. What a wonderful, reassuring place yeah. to be. And his Facebook post from January 31st, it's clear that he knows that that's where he is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you go to Michael S. Heiser, the page on Facebook, he has been posting several times a day just apologetics uh, videos and, and mm -hmm. long form essays that I, I think he's trying to make sure one last time mm -hmm. that we've, we're understanding the Bible in context. This is a, an example of Paul. And what he meant by running the race right to the end. Yeah. Yeah. Most of us would be like, okay, I did my work. I'm just going to lie here and relax. Uh huh. No, he's still working. His ministry will continue. Mm -hmm. His ministry, if you're not familiar with it, and I'll put a link in the notes, um, is called Miklat, M-I-Q-L-A-T. And that will continue. Mm -hmm. That nonprofit organization will continue. They've been translating Mike's books into other languages and distributing them. Um, especially in areas where people don't have the financial resources that we do in the West. Right. You know, just distributing the word and helping people to see the divine counsel right. in the Getting Bible. Right, his books right. translated. It's, it's an amazing service. Right. So it, it is a 501c3. So if you feel led to donate, mm -hmm. that is tax deductible if that's important to you. Our ministry, however, is not. Derek right, and right. I are tiny and we decided we're not going to do that because, frankly, we like to be able to say whatever we want. Yeah. And, <laughs> if we were worldwide and worrying about translations and things like that, right. we'd probably feel different. But. And, and there are, yes. And if we were taking in the kind of finances where we would need that accountability, yeah. But uh, yeah, there are a lot of hoops you have to jump through for the IRS to qualify as a 501c3. I but then know. again, that ties you to whichever government uh, during the previous administration, they loosened mm, the regulations yeah. as mm. to what you could say, but those have been tightened back up again, at least for some 501c3s. Yeah. Not all of them. There Not are some that them. just say whatever they want and don't have to worry because the government's on their side. But I digress. <laughs> That never happens. It happens all the time. It never. You're the bunny. You're of the rabbit. We can Follow, bunny trail. All or we, we can vole trail. Although we we're can, not seeing too many vole trails I out there this morning. No. That was a new falls. thing this year. We'd never seen the vole trails out there before. Yeah. Turns out we learned something new. Voles, which are like field mice, basically, 
they they leave trails like moles, but right on the surface of your yeah, lawn. But they only do it. Than a mouse. They only do it when there's snow cover, so they don't get eaten by hawks. Like, <laughs> oh, okay. We have lots of hawks around we here. We do, and ha- owls, ha- hawks, and owls. Yeah, yep. and crows and blue jays, and mm. also uh, um, coyotes mm-hmm. that will eat that. Yeah. So yes, beginning Psalm with Psalm 107. 107. This begins the uh, final portion of the Psalms, Book Five. Yeah, and it continues. Psalm 106 and that theme sort of recounting the history of Israel, it, um, it essentially just looking back at where Israel had been and how they, uh, how they were dealt with by God. Psalm 107, oh, give thanks to Yahweh for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of Yahweh say so whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands. Now, this verse, I think, no, is interesting. No, in the Septuagint, says, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. True. That's actually, different than trouble. That, that's true. And in, in the, uh, the, the ESV note says, from the hand of the foe. Mm. So that is the literal reading of the Hebrew. I like um, that better. Yeah. Uh, the Net Bible, they render it uh, pretty much the same way, delivered from the power of the enemy. So that is a, a different sense. Let the redeemed of Yahweh say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the foe and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. And we're going to stop stop there. This, I can see why the translators, the English translators, rendered this east, west, north, south. Because the Hebrew words translated east and west. When you do a search for those Hebrew words in the Bible, not searching for the English word, but for the Hebrew that's what they mean. Right. East is, is kind of evenly divided, sometimes uh, translated toward the sunrise, but that's what it means, towards the east. Right. It's the, the Hebrew word there is Mitzrah. Mm-hmm. From the north. Now, that is Tzaphon. And we've said before that the Hebrew word for the compass point north, Tzaphon, is that word because that was the name of the mountain that was sacred to Baal. That was where Baal's palace was located, Mount Saphon, which is in the north on the border between, it's near Antioch, or Antakya. Yes, Mrs. G? Oh, Mr. Hand is raised. Mr. Gilbert, yes, I was raising my hand because even before we get to those compass points Mm -hmm. from the lands, the word there is Eretz. So it could mean from the places that are on the, the earth, mm-hmm. because since we've got what appear to be four cardinal points, that, that seems like that. But since we have a reference at the very end to Yam, the idea of Eretz as in the underworld, mm-hmm. I think, may be part of that idea. Could be. Could be. So just bookmark that. Yeah, to, yeah. To put it in your just, just a reminder that when you see that word translated land or earth, Eretz, sometimes it refers to the netherworld, depending on the context. But uh, the north and the south is Tzaphon and Yam. Yes. And in other Semitic languages, similar to ancient Hebrew, the word for north is Samal, which means left, as in your left hand. As you're facing east toward the sunrise, (laughs) Mm -hmm. your left hand points north. So that's why Samal means north in Akkadian and Ugaritic and other Semitic languages. But in Hebrew, because the Baal was so important to their pagan neighbors, and because supernatural trouble came from cosmic north, from Baal, that became the name for Compass Point North. Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting, when I looked at south, because I saw north, I was like, okay, let me look that up. Oh, yeah, that Safan, that's what I thought. What word is translated south? And that is Yom. Mm-hmm. When you do a search for that word in the Old Testament, you find 363 references to Yom. But generally, south is Yamin, isn't it? South is Yamin. That means right. Mm-hmm. So when you're looking as in Ben Yamin, son of the right hand, Mm -hmm. or southerner. Yes. Yeah. Here it is not Yamin, it is Yam, which means sea, but it's also the Canaanite word for the chaos monster, the equivalent of Tiamat or Leviathan. Which is why I brought up Eretz. Right, yeah. And it has the same sort of cosmic sense as Tafan. It's not geographic north, it's cosmic north, you've got this heavenly enemy in Baal, and then Yom, you've got this cosmic enemy from below. Another word for Yom is Typhon, as in, in the Tzaphon. Greek. In the Greek, right, right. exactly. So if you're going to go to Tzaphon and talk about that, that is the, the supposedly where Typhon burrowed underneath of that mountain. To get away from Zeus. So you, Yes, so you've got the false heavenly realm, mm-hmm. as in the Titans, 
or the uh, Zeus and his Olympians. Mm-hmm. And then you've got the false, you know, uh, other realm, which are pretending to be the, the... So you've got the good guys and the bad guys, the white magic and the black magic, so to speak, mm-hmm. you know, the, the Olympians and the Titans. Right, right. It's interesting that in a way, both refer to North. True. Both Yom. S- right. Scholars are convinced that Typhon derives its name from Tephon because of the conflict between Zeus and Typhon at yes. that mountain. Or did the mountain get its name from Typhon? Yes. I yeah, don't know. That's know. a good question. But going back to East and West, this ancient idea that the West represents the other world or mm-hmm. the underworld or right. death, mm-hmm. and that the rising sun is victorious over death, right. therefore it represents rebirth. Which is why the temple, and not just the temple on, you know, Solomon's temple on the Temple Mount, but all temples in the ancient world, their doors open to the East. Mm-hmm. So I think that this passage, I don't believe that there's one correct interpretation right only the cardinal points of the earth i think that there's there are layers here yeah i would argue that the north and the south is probably the least likely interpretation that the reason it's in the bible as it is is because modern english translators didn't understand the connotation the cosmic connotation of Saphon mm-hmm. and yam or chose to desupernaturalize it just because well you know they're not really you know, they don't really, they're not really real. They're imaginary because let, let me finish this point okay. in, in the old Testament. When you search for Yom, you find 363 uses of that word. Mm-hmm. And when it's not translated sea, meaning the Mediterranean, it's tra- or um, in the case of the Reed sea or the red sea, it's Yom Suf. It's translated West. Yes. It's never translated South. Except this one verse. Yes. Now, let me argue again for a supernatural connotation or, or interpretation. Which I agree with. Yes. I think it's it's a floor wax and a dessert topic. <laughs> <laughs> that if you back up to whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, mm-hmm. then we get this redemption from the hand of the enemy, where he yes. redeemed them from. And then in verse 4, we get, they wandered in the wilderness. Yes, some wandered in desert waste, which there is the location of the... There yeah. are quite a number of, of references in mm-hmm. this psalm that seem to imply valley of the shadow of death, wilderness being a dry place, as in the place of the Rephaim, the mm-hmm. demons. Over and over we see, he has redeemed us from death. Bingo. Capital D. Bingo, yes. Spot on. Oh, thank you. I, I agree I completely. Point. Yes. Point for me. <laughs> So the the hand of the enemy that they're, that Israel is being redeemed from, and for all of us collectively as followers of Yahweh of God, is not our physical enemies like you know the Babylonians or the Philistines or whatever. It's Baal and the Semitic Olympians, if you will. Yes, Astarte uh-huh. and Reshef and all of them, and the Titans, all of them in the netherworld in the abyss. It's. Yeah, that that's that's who God is redeeming yes. us from. Death, where is thy yeah, I sting. victory? Right. I sting. Yes. So th- this is more supernatural than most of us have been taught. So verse three again, gathered in from the lands, from the arets, from the east and from the west, and and, 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 you, and you're right again with this in the context, redeemed from the arets, redeemed from the netherworld. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from death. Oh, oh. Mm-hmm. You, I, I agree. Oh, honey. <laughs> you get kisses. <laughs> Gathered in from the lands, He's from the so east, cute when he and from the west, like that. <laughs> <laughs> and from the north, from Tsephon, and from Yam, from the abyss, from the chaos. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Is that ear? Probably. It is ear, which we we've, we've discussed yeah, this before. Ear is a is a cognate, same word, different language. In, Ar- in Aramaic, the word usually means watcher. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we argue that in some places here, depending on context, it means watcher as well. To be called a city, you had to have a gate dedicated uh-huh. to a watcher or to a deity of some kind. Right. The Babel, mm-hmm. the gate of the God. I, I think here, it, finding no way to a city to dwell in, that probably does refer to a city. But it mm-hmm. is interesting that those words are equivalent. Yeah, yeah, isn't it though? Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to Yahweh in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. 
Now, in this case, city probably means refuge, Mm -hmm. an actual place with walls and to provide what they need. But spiritually speaking, he is leading us to Jerusalem. He is Mm -hmm. leading us to the cosmic Jerusalem, to the Mount of Assembly, his true Mount of Mm -hmm. Assembly, not any of the fake ones. He's redeemed us from those. Right. Let them thank Yahweh for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. Yes, fettered in pottery, poverty and iron. This is another idea of redemption. Redemption means you've been bought back. Mm-hmm. Why do we need to be bought back? Because we've sold ourselves into slavery. There is a yoke upon our necks called sin and mm-hmm. death. And that is represented here by the word iron. The um, yeah, bound in painful iron mm-hmm. chains. Mm-hmm. The, the Net Bible translates it utter darkness, but the Hebrew literally reads those who sat in darkness and deep darkness. Yes, this says shadow of death mm-hmm. in the Septuagint. Right. And I think it's like uh, uh, something mavet. In the Hebrew. Yes, yes. The Hebrew term is Tzal Maveth. Yes. Deep darkness, which means shadow of death. Mm-hmm. Other authorities prefer to vocalize the two or vocalize the form differently and understand it as an abstract mound meaning darkness. The Net Bible again translates it they sat in utter darkness. No, this is uh um, But shadow of death really is interesting because it relates to the prophecy of Isaiah. Yes. The messianic prophecy of Isaiah nine. Let me go to something I found this morning. Keep talking. Well, I was going to go to something I found. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not this morning, but uh, previously. Isaiah 9, um, which is the Messianic prophecy. This is the same chapter that uh, includes, for, us to ch- for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Right. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. This is uh, Isaiah 9, verse 1. But in the latter time, so this is a Messianic prophecy. He has made glorious the way of the sea. That's the Via Maris, which is the road that the Romans uh, used. Well, (laughs) the way of the sea is a very ancient road that leads from Egypt to Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. It goes up to the Sea of Galilee, goes up to uh, Hatzor between the Sea of Galilee and Mount Hermon, and then cuts off northeast towards Damascus. Um, The way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, east of the Jordan River. So he's talking about Bashan now, Galilee of the nations, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness or those who dwelt in the shadow of death. Yes. On them has light shone. That yes. was a prophecy of Jesus coming. And it relates to this again, being in deep darkness or being in the shadow of death. Amen. A, a reference to that redemption. We Bashan, see a, yeah. a, a, another version of this in John, uh, Job 24. For the morning is to them, even as the shadow of death, If one knows them, they are in the terrors of the shadow of death. Job 24, 17. Yeah, I read that this morning. That's why I had to look it up again. That is an interesting phrase that we think only comes from Psalm 23. Mm -hmm. But we also see it in Matthew 4 when he quotes from Isaiah 9 and and says that Jesus moving to Capernaum on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee fulfilled that movement to bring light to the region of the shadow of death. Yes, and again in Job 20, uh, sorry, Job 10, 21, before I go, whence I shall not return, even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. Hmm. This is referring to the world of the dead, the underworld. Yeah. Which, when you look at where the megalithic monuments mm-hmm. to the dead are located in the ancient Near East, the, the lands of the Bible. Exactly. And That's go- that area north of the Sea of Galilee. Yes, it goes on yeah. in, in the same chapter, chapter 10 of Job, verse 22, a land of darkness as darkness itself hmm. and of the shadow of death without any order and where the light is as darkness. Hmm. We're talking about a super dark place, mm-hmm. not just dark physically, but the fact that there is, yes, yeah, there is nothing spiritually good in that place. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Mm-hmm. It is the essence of wickedness itself. Jesus confronted death in a literal sense, not Mm -hmm. just death as a biological condition, but the spirits responsible for death. Yes. Yes. Oh, I, I, I so, so love this. Mm. And uh, we will probably expand in this on our, our book that we keep referring to, but 
just haven't finished yet. And we, we, we say we haven't had the time, and the fact is we haven't. It's because you and I have been trying to do so many things mm-hmm. and expand so much of our ministry in the last year. But boy, this is a book that is near and dear to our hearts. We are working on it, but yeah. we want to make a, sure. A lot of it is research right now. Yeah, So much of it mm-hmm. is. I was telling Derek about some stuff I was reading this morning for that referencing. We, we, we have talked before, boy, this is bunny trail. Look at the bunnies hopping down this <laughs> corridor. Bunnies oh, and voles. Oh, wow. not a hawk in sight. Um, Derek and I love Godzilla movies, kaiju movies, and there is a movie called Godzilla King of Monsters, which has tons of stuff in it. We've mentioned it to our good friends, Aaron Judkins and Judd... uh, um, Burton. Burton, thank you. (laughs) almost said Nelson. Oh, that's not even, (laughs) not even close. Judd Judd Burton. And the the fact that they need to watch that film, but uh, because there are tons of stuff in there with regards to the Titans, because they're Mm -hmm. called the Titans. Mm Mm-hmm. But uh, the the device that is used to, quote unquote, control them, but actually it awakens them, Mm -hmm. brings them into man's domain, summons them, is called the Orca. Orca is another name for Pluto slash Hades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Orca. Orcas. Yeah. Opening the gates of the netherworld. Exactly. That's mm-hmm. what this film was saying. And brings forth the Titans. Yeah, and they tried to explain it by saying, well, we're trying to figure out a way to communicate with whales. That's why we call it Orca. Okay, except mm-hmm. that's not really why. No. They may not even realize it, but yeah, they, they could have called it anything. No, I know they could yeah. have. So anyway, there you go. Yeah. So back mm. to verse... Let's go to verse four again. Some wandered in desert waste and a Again, in the ancient world, deserts were the haunt of demons, Mm -hmm. finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to Yahweh in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. Let them thank Yahweh for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, Mm -hmm. prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to Yahweh in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. And actually that could be considered prophetic as well, referring to the Messiah. Yes. Let them thank Yahweh for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Hold on, hold on. What verse are you reading? That was 14. 15, 15. 14. Yeah. Okay. Let them thank Yahweh for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, for he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. He broke to pieces the brazen gates Mm -hmm. and crushed the iron bars. This is the very structure and uh, portals into the various levels of the underworld. Yeah. And not just in the Bible. This is how the, 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 the boundaries of mind perceived this, right? The boundaries of Tartarus were Mm -hmm. conceived by the, the Greeks or the netherworld Mm -hmm. to the Hurrians for their former gods. Mesopotamians, Mm -hmm. because the Sumerian myths refer to uh, Inanna going through seven gates to get down. Each one probably uh, uh, ruled over by a judge. Mm -hmm. There are seven judges in the underworld. Yeah, the Egyptian netherworld is the same way. There's seven doors that were each each controlled by a watcher. Yes. The Egyptian word for watcher. Yeah. Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities, suffered affliction. They and loathed. Verse, that was seventeen. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to this, the gates of death. This is seventeen, the Septuagint. That's why it's sometimes it's so different. He helped them out of the way of their iniquity. Mm. Nothing in here about fools, mm. for they were brought low because of their iniquities. Hmm. Uh, Verse 18, they loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried to Yahweh in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. And that word is... Delivered them uh, from... Sehothoth. Oh, okay. Yeah. And delivered is based on... No, it's not uh, not Mashiach. Mm. Let them thank Yahweh for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of joy. 
Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of Yahweh, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. What's the word here for deep? Um, let's see. Uh, it is me- Meshula. Okay. I didn't know if it yeah, was Yeah, just not to home. Um, yes, yeah, so we go from the ministry to those in the wilderness, a place of controlled by the spirits, the fallen, fallen realm, mm-hmm. to the sea. Yeah. Areas that are controlled by the fallen realm. But we get to Tiamat in verse 26. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. They mounted up to heaven, that's Shemaim, which uh, was a deity in the Canaanite pantheon, and by the way. It's verse... equivalent of Uranus. That's verse 26. Boy, okay. Can we go back to 23 and start there? Sure. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of Yahweh, his wondrous works in the deep. I I missed 25. That's why I'm asking where you were. Yeah. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. And that is prophetic. Yes. The Lord commands, not only was it fulfilled in the Old Testament in the Exodus, but over and over, he speaks to the waves. He Mm -hmm. speaks to Yom and down Yes, yeah. And again, Yom being the Canaanite name for the chaos monster Leviathan. Mm -hmm. They mounted up to heaven, Shemaim. They went down to the depths, and that is uh, Tehom, Ah. which is Tiamat, the Sumerian chaos monster Leviathan. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. Hebrew. And all their wisdom is swallowed up. Yeah, that's what the Hebrew literally reads. Their, all their wisdom was swallowed up. Then they cried to Yahweh in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. This, in a sense, a reference to the uh, the Red Sea crossing, mm-hmm. but... Um, also to Jesus when he sense. speaks to the way, sure. speaks mm-hmm. to the storm. Verse 30, then they were glad that the waters were quiet and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank Yahweh for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. The assembly of the elders. Mm. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of its inhabitants. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. Okay, a fruitful land into a salty waste. Hmm, Sodom. Yeah. A salty waste, oh yes. That is true. The uh, team working at Tal El Hammam, and they're there as we speak right now, we're getting their daily news updates and seeing the pictures of their work. When they discovered the salt at that site, which is 75 feet above the valley, which is uh, the Jordan Valley just north of the Sea of Ga- uh, the Dead Sea, rather, they did some soil samples down in the valley there, and they found that for a period of about 700 years, down to the time of David, it was only in the time of David, around 1000 BC, that they were able to start farming that area again because it had been so poisoned by salt from the Dead Sea that for 700 years, the only thing that would grow there were acacias. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a really good catch. A fruitful land into a salty waste. And when you see it from Mount Nebo today, it's green. That is like prime farmland for Jordan. It's been long enough now that things will grow again. Right. Yeah. Yeah, The salt has been washed out of the uh, soil. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing, they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock diminish. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let them consider the steadfast love of Yahweh." That is so good. Well, let me find the next one here. And it is First Chronicles. First Chronicles 13. Uh, 13, yes. Right. This uh, 
This is, yeah. David's been crowned king in Jerusalem, and so now they're uh, going to consolidate, or he's going to consolidate uh, everything there in Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. There's some interesting stuff in these uh, these chapters. Uh, Verse 13, David consulted with the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and from Yahweh our God... Let us send abroad to our brothers who remain in all the lands of Israel, as well as to the priests and Levites in the cities that have pasture lands, that they may be gathered to us. Then let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. I think the connotation there is we did not seek his will in the days of Saul. I think that is exactly what it probably means. All the assembly agreed to do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So David assembled all Israel from the Nile of Egypt to Lebo Hamat. That's, that's way in the north. That's on the uh, Orontes River, which is on the border between Lebanon and Syria. And the Orontes, it was believed by pagans, was that channel carved by the chaos monster Typhon as he was trying to get away from Zeus. Orontes? Yeah, O R O N T E S. Where is that word in here? It's not there, but that's that's where Levo Hamath is located. Oh, okay. Thank you for for clarifying that because I thought I didn't say that word. <laughs> <laughs> so David assembled all Israel from the Nile of Egypt to Levo Hamath, or mm-hmm. Montes, to bring the ark of God from Kiryat Jearim, and David and all Israel went up to Baala, and that is to Kiryat Jearim, Jearim. Jearim, it's mm-hmm. Jearim, mm-hmm. probably, that belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of Yahweh, who sits enthroned above the cherubim. Mm-hmm. It is not a radio to talk to God. That is his throne. Yes. And they carried the Ark of God on a new cart from the house of Avinadav, and Utsa and, and Ahio were driving the cart which probably meant that they were either sitting on, oh, but more likely they were standing beside the oxen right. and making mm-hmm. sure they went the right way. And David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, with song and lyres and harps and tambourines and cymbals and trumpets. This was a noisy procession. And when they came to the threshing floor of Kidon, hmm. this underline is a that because... I read that this morning and thought, hold on, Mm -hmm. has that always been there? (laughs) Yeah. And when they came to the threshing floor of Kidon, Utsa put out his hand to take hold of the ark, for the oxen stumbled. Mm -hmm. And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Utsa, and he struck him down because he put out his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. Let's stop for a minute. This is one of those things that's difficult for people reading this. It's yeah, like, we think, well, that's mean. That's mean. He's trying to keep the ark from falling and hitting the ground. What was the point? Uh, why, why did God strike him? Well, it's very likely that they were not transporting the ark in the way they were supposed to. They exactly. had it on the back of a cart instead of having Levites carrying it on the poles like and it was supposed to be done. David gets that in an upcoming chapter. Right. You are so right. The other thing is, what was going on here spiritually? Mm-hmm. They have approached a threshing floor. These are more than places to just separate chaff from wheat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you wrote that chapter in the book Veneration about threshing floors as portals. That's why it really caught my eye this morning, well, and sure. I was like, well, yeah, I missed that before. How well, can I do that? We How read through the Bible that? last time. We thought, okay, this is just where they're practicing an agricultural task. So what was going on? Yeah. Did the fallen realm cause the oxen to stumble? Or God allowed it just to say, look, you're not following the law because he yes. gave Moses very clear instructions. That's why there are the rings on the sides of the ark and the poles that the Levites were supposed to use to carry the ark on their shoulders. They weren't supposed to put it on the back of a cart drawn by oxen like a load of hay. Exactly. The other thing I see here is that, yes, they were all excited and making lots of music and dancing, and they're all super happy. But what was really behind their thinking? Mm. What was behind David's thinking? Was it, hey, I'm bringing God to town? That could be. Hey, it's on. It, look what we're doing. 
Mm-hmm. Look how great we are bringing God to town. You know, we're going to put him on this cart and we're going to parade him around. That's pagan behavior. It is. You don't do that. Mm-hmm. So I don't very, know, very really know. Very much like the Akitu festival when you had the uh, idol representing your deity and bringing him into the city with pomp and circumstance. Yeah, exactly. Now, this being the throne of God, you're supposed to treat it with great reverence and respect. Yes. And it, it never occurred to me before reading this this morning. Is like, Again, that's kind of an odd thing, but they were hauling it like it was, you know, cargo. Yes, exactly. Instead of treating it like the throne of God, which was very clear in the book of Leviticus. God gave this in Exodus. God gave the instructions to Moses. And he's got Levites with him. Right. Nobody said, hey, dude, mm-hmm. <laughs> king, uh, buddy, we don't do it this way. Mm-hmm. Have you read the scrolls? <laughs> So yes, verse nine again. And when they came to the threshing floor of Kidon, what does Kidon meaning mean? Um, good question. I did not look that up. I'm I'm assuming that's just the. Uh, and what does Utsa's name mean? Because uh, we're given his name. It could have said a man. One of the drivers. Yeah, it is. Well, okay, Kidon, just the owner of the. Threshing floor. Let me do a quick word study here. Bringing up my Logos Bible software. What does it mean? All of the references seem to be Perez Utza. There we go. Dictionary of Classical Hebrew. Kedon means spinning, spinning. Oh, great. The answer is in Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it I'm means, hold scholar. on. It means. Uh, Javelin. Hmm. And the uh, pronunciation, according to the that's easy for you to say, quick guide to pronouncing Bible names is Kaiden. Oh, th- th- that seems odd. I know, but uh, that's what it says right there. Let's find out Utsa's name, or Utsaya, whichever it is. Uh, his name means. Hmm. Hmm. It doesn't really give the literal meaning of... Oh, it means strength. Oh, that's interesting. So this was probably a really strong guy. Yeah, as you would be, I guess, to be a teamster. Yeah. Which is what he was. I mean, literally, because you had a team of oxen. That's where the name came from, by the way, teamster. Yeah, he wasn't a Um, unionist. And Kaiden, by the way, is also uh, known as Nakon, N-A-C-O-N, or Nakon. Huh. He owned that threshing floor near Jerusalem. Yeah. So again, verse nine. And when they came to the threshing floor of Kidon, I'm sorry, it just doesn't, Kaiden doesn't sound right um, because it's an I. Usually that's an I or an E sound. Yeah. Uh, Utsa put out his hand to take hold of the ark for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Utsa and he struck him down because he put out his hand to the ark and he died before God. And David was angry because Yahweh had broken out against Utsa. Yeah. Instead of, oh my, uh, we we did this the wrong way. Uh, he gets angry. And that place is called Peretz Utsa to this day. Yeah. See, uh, Septuagint reads, David was disheartened. Hmm. And David was frightened of God on that day. You would be, wouldn't yes. you? And Peretz Utsa, breach of Utsa? Yeah. He, the Lord broke out against Utsa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, 12, verse 12, and David was afraid of God that day. And he said, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? <laughs> oh, what if Yahweh's mad at me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So David did not take the ark home into the city of David, but took it aside to the house of Obed, Obed, Edom, mm-hmm. the Gittite. Yeah, it is Obed. I did look that up. Um, I think. Well, I'm going to have to double check that. And the ark of God remained with the household of Obed Edom in his house three months. And Yahweh blessed the household of Obed Edom and all that he had. Mm -hmm. Good for Obed. Yeah. The the name probably means servant of something. And the question scholars have been asking for years is, is it Edom, servant of Edom? Yeah, if it means servant of Edom, does it mean the country or does it mean the national god of Edom, Kaus? Yes, good question. Or it's possible, then there are some scholars who point to a lesser Canaanite deity mentioned as the wife of Reshef. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, the consort of Reshef named Udam. 
Oh, that's so. Uh, but it, it, we don't know. But the bottom line is, this may be a, have been a, someone who didn't necessarily no. wasn't necessarily raised in the faith of Israel. He may have been an Israelite born in Gath. There was also a a Gath that That's was the, um, the Gittite part, right? The Gittite part. The, the Philistine Gath is the one we know, but there was one in the territory of Dan that was uh, named Gath Rimon, hmm. Gath of the Thunderer. Ah, yes. And so he may have been from that region. He may have been a Philistine who converted to uh, uh, Yahwism and became a Hebrew. He because, certainly was blessed by Lord when the uh, ark was there. Right. And and David did have Philistines in his personal bodyguard. He attracted a number of Philistines to him when he was in the city of uh, Ziklag mm-hmm. and uh, pretending to serve the uh, uh, Akish mm-hmm. of the Philistines, king of the Philistine uh, city of Gath. Right. So it was, um, yeah, it, uh, it's an interesting hard to know. thing that, that we've got. First of all, we're not exactly sure where it had been stored up north somewhere, you know, probably a Hebron. Uh, but when it's brought down, it's just put into somebody's house. And these mm-hmm. weren't gigantic houses necessarily. So where was it? Living room? A barn? Stable? Could be, yeah. Did did David leave some priests there? We're going to leave this these guys to, to make sure you don't do anything stupid because this thing just killed a guy. And Obed Edom may have been a uh, Levite himself. May have been, yes. So, there, there That's are, a good... There are four people with this name mentioned in the Old Testament. So the question is, how are they all related or are they the same? Well, two of them are most certainly not the same guy because one of them was a custodian of temple treasures for King Joash. And uh, Joash lived about 400 years after David. Right. So not the same guy. But he may have been named after him. Might have been named after mm-hmm. him. There were three, though, in uh, Chronicles and Second Samuel that we will come across. This is the first one, Obed-Edom the Gittite. Mm-hmm. Then there's a gatekeeper mentioned in First Chronicles 15, which we might get to this week, um, who's, the, uh, who's a gatekeeper, son of Yeduthun. And then there's one who's named in First Chronicles 26 as a son of Korah through Korah. Um, and th- mm. those those guys, that may be all one, one and the same. Maybe. We, d- we don't know for sure. Good, good but point. certainly the guy who served Joash is not the same guy. And now you get chapter 14. Chapter 14. And Haram, king of Tyre, or Hiram, if you prefer, sent uh, messengers to David and cedar trees, also masons and carpenters, to build a house for him. And David knew that Yahweh had established him as king over Israel, and that his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. And David took more wives in Jerusalem, because <laughs> that's what you do when you're a king in the ancient uh, it Near is, East. It is. It is. Uh, we, we, this is not how we do it now, but back mm-hmm. in the day, the more wives you had, the more important you were. Right. And uh, this is how you cemented treaties with your neighbors. You exactly. took in their daughters. David fathered more sons and daughters. These are the names of the children born to him at Jerusalem. Shemua, Shovav, Nathan, Solomon, Ifhar, Elishua, Elpalet, Noga, Nepheg, Yaphia, Elishama, Be'elada, Be'eliada, and Eliphalet. And uh, those, most of them will disappear from the pages mm-hmm. of history. Because they weren't part of the main plot. Right. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, all the Philistines went up to search for David. But David heard of it and went out against them. Now the Philistines had come and made a raid in the Valley of Rephaim. Or in Valley the of the Giants. Valley, yeah. that's what the Septuagint says. And David inquired of God, shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And Yahweh said to him, go up, and I will give them into your hand. And he went up to Baal Peretzim, and David struck them down there. And David said, God has broken through against my enemies. Uh, again, Perez, mm-hmm. breakthrough. Yep, a breach, yeah. mm-hmm. God has broken through my enemies by my hand like a bursting flood. Therefore, the name of that place is called Baal Peretzim. And they left their gods there, and David gave command, and they were burned. Okay. He at least knew, don't take these home. Yes. And the Philistines yet again made a raid in the valley. This is a valley that extends southwest from the city of Jerusalem. You can see it to this day. Um, When David again inquired of God, God said to him, you shall not go up after them. Go around and come against them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then go out to battle, for God has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. Stop there. I love that. Mm -hmm. When you hear the sounds of marching in the tops of the trees, Mm -hmm. 
He hears the battle yes. going on in the spirit realm. The presence of the heavenly host. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And David did as God commanded him, and they struck down the Philistine army from Gibeon to Getzer. And the fame of David went out into all lands, and, the, and Yahweh brought the fear of him upon all nations. So love that. Got time for chapter um, 15? Yes, 15. I don't think we'll get to 16 today. Okay, chapter 15. Finally, we get the ark to Jerusalem. David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said that no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God. Finally got through. For Yahweh had chosen them to carry the ark of Yahweh and to minister to him forever. Yeah, they realized, oh, we, we, okay, that, that was the reason for the problem. God's yeah. not mad at me. We just didn't follow the rules for transporting the ark. Yeah, so I made him a special tabernacle. Yeah. I fitted it out really nicely. <laughs> this time we'll have the Levites do it instead of renting a U-Haul. <laughs> Oh, gosh, that's sort of the equivalent of what he did. Yeah, and it was sad because... It was, was a, a, hey, it's a brand new cart. Come yeah. on, we built him a cart. It'll be much easier than having yeah. the guys having to walk it all the way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, verse 3, And David assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of Yahweh to its place, which he had prepared for it. And David gathered together the sons of Aaron and the Levites of the sons of Kohat, Uriel the chief. Oh, with, 120s of his brothers. Yeah, it's not named just the, an angel name. Named for the archangel. How about yeah. that? Huh? Of the sons of Merari, Asiah, the chief, and 220 of his brothers. Of the sons of Geshom, Yoel, the chief, with 130 of his brothers. Of the sons of Elitzaphan, Shemaiah, the chief, with 200 of his brothers. Of the sons of Hebron, Eliel, the chief, with 80 of his brothers. Of the sons of Uziel, Aminadav, the chief, with 112 of his brothers. Then David summoned the priests, Zadok and Abiathar. Or Eviatar, as Eviatar, yeah. yeah. And the Levites, Uriel, Asiah, Yoel, Shemaiah, Eliel, and Aminadav, and said to them, You are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves. Stop there. Nowhere in here do we see, and they got the ashes of the red heifer, and they did all this stuff, and mm-hmm. we just see consecrate yourselves. Yeah, that's a good point. It may mean that they didn't do it, or it was just not necessary to make to be explicit ex- because they understood that, that was part of the process. It could be because it had been a long time yeah. since they had ministered in this way, right. and especially since this is a brand new place and everything. Mm-hmm. So at this point, I assumed Sedok was the head priest, but uh, since he's listed first, mm-hmm. but. Um, you are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, you and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of Yahweh, the God of Israel, to the place that I am prepared for it. I love that. Because you did not carry it the first time. Mm-hmm. Yahweh our God broke out against us because we did not seek him according to the rule. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to, I love the way this is put though. I prepared a place for him, and we didn't follow the rules. It mm-hmm. wasn't just me. It was a sort of a joint decision. We, words matter. Mm-hmm. And whether or not that was in David's heart, I have no idea. It's just sometimes I find yeah. it interesting. That's what the Septuagint says, too. So that, that Yeah, it, I and yeah. we. Uh, verse 13 again. Because you did not carry it the first time, the Yahweh our God broke out against us because we did not seek him according to the rule. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles, as Moses had commanded according to the word of Yahweh. David also commanded the chiefs of the Levites to appoint their brothers as the singers who would play loudly on musical instruments, on harps and lyres and cymbals to raise sounds of joy. So maybe this time the appropriate people are dancing Mm -hmm. and singing and playing the instruments. Verse 17, so the Levites appointed Hermon, Herman, 
Haman. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I wanted to put an R in there so badly. Haman, the son of Yoel and of the brother. I like Harmon better. <laughs> <laughs> no, Haman, the son of Yoel. When you have astigmatism and you're reading, sometimes you can, I, I can see what looks like the shadow of an R in front mm-hmm. of an M, depending upon the font. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I make it a little bigger with, you know, my pinch out thing. And yeah, it's Haman, son of Yoel and of his brothers Asaph, the son of Berechiah, and of the sons of Merari, their brothers, Etan, the son of Cushiah. And with them, their brothers of the son of second order, Zerachiah, Yahatziel, Shemi Merath, Yahiel, Unri, sorry, Uni, Eliav, Benaya, Maaseah, Maaseah, Matatia, Mata, Matitia, Matitia, well, Matatia, Thia, yeah, is what it looks like. I'm trying to figure out how it might be pronounced. Yeah. Mattathiah, we'll just call it that, that. Cleverly arranged it so you get all the names this week. <laughs> I noticed <laughs> that. <laughs> Eliphalehu, although the, you did get some. Mikneya and the gatekeepers of Oved Edom. There he is. And Yael. Yael. Mm-hmm. The singers, Haman. Haman. Got it right. Asaph. I mean, Asaph, the psalmist. Yes. And Ethan, or Ethan, mm-hmm. were to sound bronze cymbals. And Zerachiah, Atiel, Shemir, Shemir, Shemir Mot, uh, Yechiel, Uni, Eliav, Maasiah, and Benaniah were to play harps according to Alamot. Is that? A musical term, probably. Oh, probably. Yeah. But Mattathiah, or Mattathiah, uh, Elephelehu, uh, Mikneya, Oved Deidam, Yael, and Atsatsia were to lead with lyres, according to the Shaminit. Another musical term. Um, Hechaknaya. Hechaknaya. Leader, it almost sounds like my dad's name. Leader of the huh. Levites in music should direct the music for he understood it. Berechiah and Elkanah, that sounds very much like my dad's name, were to be, I think my dad's name may be like somewhere etymologically linked back in the days to Noah, Mm -hmm. were to be gatekeepers for the ark. Shabanah, Josaphat, Mm -hmm. Netanel, Amasai, Zerachiah, Benaniah, and Eliezer, the priest, should blow the trumpets before the Ark of God. Oved Adam and Yehia were to be gatekeepers for the Ark. So David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of thousands went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh from the house of Oved Adam with rejoicing. They were happy. Mm-hmm. And because God helped the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, they sacrificed seven bulls. And seven rams. It Again, says, yeah, and says the Septuagint, they each sacrificed seven calves and seven rams. I remember that from this morning because mm-hmm. I read that this morning. And so that that's a lot of sacrificing if they each right. gave one. Mm-hmm. But that makes sense that they would each give one. Verse 27, David was clothed with a robe of fine linen as also, that's interesting that he is, because he is the ancestor of, of our Lord, Mm -hmm. who in the book of Revelation is clothed in fine linen. Mm -hmm. David, as will we be. David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, as also were all the Levites who were carrying the ark, and the singers, and Kananiah, and the leader of the music of the singers. And David wore a linen, linen, linen ephod. Hmm. Now, the question here is David presenting himself, fine linen and garment, ephod is he pretending to be or or acting as a high priest or was this a change in the masoretic text to emphasize david because the septuagint does not mention the ephod on david i'm glad you said that because i didn't remember it from reading the septuagint no. this morning verse 27 and- mentions the fine linen robe twice at the beginning of the verse and at the end of the verse there's no mention of david wearing the ephod yeah, in the septuagint this is a big deal underline yes. this in your bible because this requires more research mm-hmm. The Why Masoretic would the text, Masoretes put that? They emphasize the kingship of David. The and, high priesthood. And David. the high priesthood of David, yeah. Which 
being from the tribe of Judah is not where the priests were supposed to come. But later on, it would transfer to Judah. Right. For the Messiah. Mm -hmm. But David was not that yet. And uh, it is interesting that in the Septuagint, just as a reminder, was completed by about 200 years before the birth of Jesus, drawn from older Hebrew texts. David is not depicted as wearing that ephod. Right. Very important. Verse 28. So all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh with shouting to the sound of the horn, trumpets, and cymbals, and made loud music on harps and lyres. So Tom Horn was preaching. Sound of the horn. <laughs> Verse 29. And the Ark, and as the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh came to the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul looked out of the window and saw King David dancing and celebrating, and she despised him mm. in her heart. Now, I've heard a lot of interpretations of that in my many, many decades of uh, listening to preaching. And I remember hearing one preacher say, well, he was unclothed. Yeah, it doesn't say that. Doesn't say that. Heard another one say that he was behaving in an erotic fashion and it embarrassed her. Mm -hmm. I really don't know, because it's unclear from the passage, why she despised him. She may have hated him because he was now king instead of her brother. She may have hated him because he was now king and still her instead of her dad. Mm -hmm. She could also be upset that uh, she helped David get away from Saul, and then David went off and just left her there and married a bunch of other women. She right. has uh, she's now down the pecking order in the wife category, mm -hmm. probably because he's got lots of other wives. And I don't know. It could also be that there was something within Michal's heart, or Michael, as we sometimes call her within her heart that she really didn't want all of this, you know, uh, uh, joy and and laughter and singing and music playing and dancing because Yahweh was coming into town. It didn't mean anything to her. Well, maybe she worshipped other gods. Who that's knows? That's possible. I mean, she helped David get away by putting one a, a teraphim. Exactly. One of so the household gods. Why did she have access to that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, still it, venerating the uh, the the household or uh, the ancestral spirits. I am sure somewhere there are lots of essays and mm -hmm. possibly dissertations written yeah. on this. Yeah. So yeah, there we're running out of time. We are. Well, we we will get to Second Samuel six before too much longer, and um, it goes into that maybe. Yeah. It uh, Michael says uh, in Second Samuel six. 20, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. Well, that's why I had the preacher say that he was probably naked. Yeah. But it doesn't say that in no. First Chronicles. And I'd like to see what it says in Septuagint in that passage. Mm -hmm. Because again, it could be somebody saying, well, let me explain here what's really going on. Yeah. Is that what he meant? No, I, I don't know. Uh, he... he Clearly is wearing a linen garment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Septuagint does not indicate that he was undressed. It's just Michael, apparently in in uh, verse 20 of 2 Samuel 6, accusing him of being undignified, uh -huh. basically. Well, here's the thing. It wasn't just Michael looking out the window. Mm -hmm. It was probably everybody in the harem. Mm -hmm. All these ladies right. looking out the windows. Hey, here comes David. David, see me? You want to, you, you, can we get together tonight? Yeah. <laughs> Septuagint, uh, Septuagint, rather the study Bible from Faith Life says Michael's contempt may have been, it may be that Michael's contempt towards David causes her to exaggerate his state of undress mm. because it's clear that he was wearing a fine wearing linen clothes. robe. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he, and an yeah. ephod, and you wouldn't think that wearing an ephod that you'd do things that were vulgar? No, you don't think so. But again, well, the Septuagint in neither version. Oh, that's version, right, that's right, sorry. Erase that part in your mind because, yeah, you're right. I doubt that he had an any fun. Mm -hmm. yes. Because that would have, I'm not sure the Levites would have allowed that. Excuse me? Shouldn't have been. Yeah, because suddenly they were being very cautious to follow the law after what happened to, remember what happened to Utsa? Mm -hmm. let's, let's follow the law to the letter this time. But if you add it to the text and you're trying to present him as a fulfillment of the king, priest, messiah, uh, model, mm -hmm. then it, it makes no sense unless you're thinking David understood he was a priest. 
And David mm-hmm. understood he was the high priest mm-hmm. because he tried to follow the rules. But I think the original text would have been more clear about that if he actually had been wearing an ephod. Right. The, the Lexham Septuagint in both Second Samuel and in First Chronicles says wearing a distinguished robe does not say wearing an ephod. There you go. I think the Masoretes were were again mm-hmm. trying to trying to give more emphasis to David and his right to be the progenitor of the line that brings forth the Messiah. Right, because later on we get now we're looking that the many of the Jews are looking for Messiah Ben David, Messiah Ben Joseph, two of them. Yes. So that's just mm-hmm. one of the reasons we read the Septuagint each week and uh compare the two because the Masoretic text, as we've said before, was completed about a thousand years after, as much as twelve hundred years after the uh, the Septuagint translation, that's and a there long were some time. little tweaks here and there. Nothing that really affects Christian doctrine because that's all in the New Testament, which is um, fulfillment of the old. But there was a de-emphasis placed on the uh, spirit realm in the Septuagint, but yes. it's still there when you know what you're looking for. It really is, like, well, especially the interesting. Um, Overlap between Greek religion and Hebrew religion. Valley of Rephaim equals Valley of Titans or Valley of Giants. You know, it's interesting in um, the Septuagint, and I forgot to go to it this morning as we were reading through that passage, but it talks about um, the ark and it being that that Yahweh sat above the Caravim. In the Septuagint, it said his name was on it. Right, right. And again, that name theology, Mm -hmm. the Masoretes wanted to erase that idea. Uh, Right. As being a second power in heaven, because Mm -hmm. the Christians were all saying, that's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. Good catch. Mm. A couple of things to uh, let you know about. First of all, um, we've rescheduled the date that we were going to go down to Morningside for the Jim Baker show. We were supposed to be there February 2nd. And that was icy that day. But we haven't officially confirmed the new date yet with Kim. So, Oh, okay. Hold off on that. Yeah. You can, if you want to pencil in, the new date is March 2nd, Mm -hmm. but we haven't confirmed. She, she gave us that date and I wrote back and said, that'll work. And now I just just need need to to know for sure that there isn't a conflict she was unaware of. Gotcha. So pencil that in pencil we'll, it in we'll let you know when March you use 2nd. the magic but, marker later. But, but tuesday if you're in the area tuesday valentine's day yeah. carl gallops is going to be down right there. right and we love carl so uh and if you're looking forward to just some real dynamic preaching just because even when he's just a guest in the show carl preaches oh doesn't that's what he carl ever. does we've talked about going down there on tuesday and, and it, it isn't necessarily because it's valentine's day it's that we we try to get as much work done early in the week as possible. So mm-hmm. today we work, Monday we work, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we start to try to relax a little bit. Believe it or not, Friday is now our day off. Yeah, that's the day I take my mom and her friend out to lunch. Uh huh. So, so we relax we on that to, day, watch kaiju movies. Right. And front, then front load the week. Yeah. Mondays and Tuesdays are busy days for us. We do. But uh, if you're in the Ozarks, yeah, and uh, you have an opportunity to get there to Morningside, Carl Gallops will be there this Tuesday, February 14th, and uh, well worth your time if you're in the area. It so is. Yeah. Now, build barn better. Mm. We have a 1,200-square-foot shop building that we want to convert into usable studio and office space. Mm-hmm. If you live in the country, you might know them as a metal pole barn. Mm-hmm. Right now, it's basically just storage and that's what it's been for eight years but um, it's there it's got power we just need to you know run more outlets around and run a 30 amp circuit for hvac it's got to be insulated and the two windows in it which are just storms we need Mm -hmm. to replace those with actual windows that we're getting estimates on right now and then we'll just put some very basic studio spaces we're envisioning kind of two spaces one where we can record Programs like Unraveling Revelation, another where I can do the five and ten updates for Skywatch TV, and also record teachings and presentations. Mm-hmm. And um, you just oh, I think. forgot to put myself on Do Not Disturb. Who's dinging you? Yeah, it is the uh, producer for a show that I was on a couple of weeks ago. Oh, okay. Well, you can take care of yeah. that later. And that that essentially is it. This is really kind of bare bones. We also want to move our. Um, stuff for the shipping, the shipping office, office out, out there. there yeah, once we make sure it's water tight right. and all of this. So yeah, it's, it's taking a little bit of money. The Lord is providing, um, 
very, very well for it, and we want to make sure that we have plenty to do what He calls us to do. So if you are called by Him, if He whispers to you to help out a little bit, every dollar helps. And you can just send, you know, go to gilberthouse.org slash donate. Mm -hmm. And the instructions are there again. We're not a 501c3. So, you know, everything you give to us, we thank you for it. But we can't, you know, you can't tax deduct it. Yeah, and we're paying taxes on it too when it comes in. So uh, there's a big red button in the right-hand column if you don't want to remember the the full address. But you'll find it there if you go to gilberthouse.org. And uh, we thank you for that. We hope to have that done by summer or fall. Yeah, and, and we also, will keep you posted. also, if you are on the app and you have access to the blog portion, uh, right now Derek is putting up a weekly uh, blog sort of excerpt from one of our books there. Mm-hmm. But we will also put photographs and and little descriptions of what's going on during the various phases of the barn project. And if you, again, if you're called to this, thank you, thank you so much. But if you are not in a position to help or the Lord doesn't say help out with a dollar or two, just please pray for us. Please, Mm, please pray for this project, but also for everything that we do, our travels. In about a month, we leave for Israel, and we're going to be gone for about three weeks, and and we're just praying for wonderful travels there. Pray for also the people in Turkey and Syria, because this earthquake has totally upset their lives. It isn't just that people have lost their lives, families have lost loved ones because of that. People have been dishoused and injured, Uh, about a hundred thousand. Excuse me, about 100,000 people have died or been injured, and about 23 million people Mm -hmm. are directly or indirectly affected by this. A lot of buildings simply collapsed, and many others are unsafe. It's incomprehensible. I mean, it is really incomprehensible. I think the only (sighs) thing—boy, I mean, the Great San Francisco Earthquake— here in the United States is probably the closest thing in recent memory that yeah. would uh, compare. And that's a hundred years ago. Most of us have forgotten about that. Most of many people have never heard mm-hmm. of it. The great Galveston hurricane of 1900. I mean, we haven't seen something like this in a very, very long time here in the United States. We've been very blessed in that regard. So pray. And if we knew of, a reputable ministry. We've not really researched this, but uh, I, I'm sure there are reputable charities out there that are accepting donations because everything, I mean, infrastructure yeah. is down. I mean, forget electricity, forget plumbing, water. It, it is just horrific. And it's in the middle of winter. Right. There's a ministry over there in Syria called Open Doors, and they probably mm-hmm. are in mm-hmm. Turkey too. Um, I don't know their web address, and I, you know, I won't even say go look at Open Doors because there are a lot of churches and ministries called Open Doors. I don't know which one this is, but I saw that the Open Doors ministry in in Syria were uh, sort of coordinating churches to accept uh, anyone who needed a home, anyone who needed a place to stay and be ministered to. Um, So I just think that is huge. This is an opportunity for us to love on our fellow man. Mm. I'll send a note to the the tour company that we've been working with in in planning our our tour of Turkey, which may well be rescheduled because I think at this point probably will be, but we'll know more soon based on the level of devastation and the fact that much of the tour we had planned were, were right in the middle of this, this zone, Mm -hmm. everything from Antakya to uh, Mount Nemrut, right? Malatya hotels may be affected. The sites may be damaged, but they may know of places, reputable places where donations can be accepted. And I'm sure at this point they're just looking for, Money rather than trying right. to ship things from the United States. I, but, uh, I would recommend seeing what uh, Franklin Graham is doing. Mm-hmm. He is a very reputable uh, place to to put your money, and I know that he has ministries throughout the world. So check and see if Franklin Graham has posted anything to either his Facebook pages or to his website. And uh, uh, gosh, just keep praying that the Lord will open hearts and and may lives be changed through this right. in a positive way, yeah, in an is, eternal way. A, a lot of tragedy, but there's some just miraculous stories of people being rescued five full days, six full days, well, five full days after the uh, the quake early Monday morning. One of the stories I saw this morning was about a little girl who was rescued, and it took the men, it was a German team working on it, mm-hmm. and it took over 50 hours. Yeah. From the time they, they knew she was there to the time they actually were able to touch her. Mm-hmm. And then a few hours past that to safely remove her. Yeah. 
it's it's heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking. It is really indeed. So yes, continue to pray for that. And thank you for praying for us. Mm. It's uh, we we feel your prayers. Amen. We truly do. Amen. Oh, by the way, what is on VFTB tonight? Uh, View from the bunker tonight. Uh, this this will be an episode that you want to take advantage of. Uh, Doctor Michael Heiser, who as we've mentioned is um, uh, very weak at this point. There was an interview that uh, we recorded with Mike in July of 2021. We found out later, because he announced his diagnosis of pancreatic cancer a month later, that he was already suffering from this mass that was growing, had not yet been diagnosed in July. Um, We broadcast it as part of our Bible's Greatest Mysteries program. Those are um, still available on the web here and there, but uh, they they were in four segments. And I edited the interview together, so it's one long segment. And it's on... Just the basics of uh, the unseen realm, the origin of demons, why giants are in the Bible, why did God tell Moses to put that stuff in there, mm-hmm. and how it affects uh, Christian theology. And there's some really, really interesting stuff in there, too. One aspect of this that I had not considered, that the reason demons are called unclean spirits in the New Testament, it's not just a reference that they're evil, but so they're unclean because they were a mixing of unlike kinds. Species, a spirit not created by the Lord. Right. Species were to reproduce after their own kind. Right. And this was a a semi-divine, semi-human, mm-hmm. which is why they were considered unclean. In fact, during the Second Temple period, that first uh, book of First Enoch, they're literally referred to as miscegenated or mm, yes. bastard spirits. Yes. So pardon the French there, but that's the word. That's what it means. Yes. It, it really does. It's mixed species. Yeah. As in one from one realm and one from another. So when you're looking at that and it's like, oh, well, that's why they're unclean. It's not because they're nasty. It's because they're literally illegitimate. They are, this is an unholy union. It truly is. Well, yeah. um, so that'll be tonight on uh, View from the Bunker, vftb.net, or better yet, just get our app and it's there. And also, we're going to um, take those amazing interviews that uh, were you, you're using on VFTB and we're going to put them into four different programs on an upcoming series on Unraveling Revelation. Mm-hmm. So if you don't get a chance to listen to or, or watch, I guess it is VFTB tonight. Either way. Yeah. Either way, you can uh, enjoy all of his teaching there. And there there are so many uh, opportunities to learn from Mike Heiser. Go to the skywatchtvstore.com. Go to Amazon. Go to uh, Micklot. Mm-hmm. There are lots of places online where you can buy his books. Um, he gives away a lot of information. He does. Um, he's got on his website. It, just go to Micklot, and I'm sure that there will be lots of links there to mm-hmm. where you can learn and learn and learn and learn. Yeah. So in the notes uh, for this study, I'll have a link to Micklot. And if you want to support the work there as a an organization that will continue. I talked with Mike about that when he called me a couple of weeks ago. Um, Drina will, it has been nominated to take over as president of the right. board and continue the work. So they're going to keep putting out the work. And I'm sure that that's how his social media accounts are, are being updated. Mm-hmm. So these teaching videos and these little, little videos of encouragement and teaching that uh, right. they've been putting out even through Mike's illness have been continued. That's through that ministry. I'm Glad. sure it is. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Lord, for that. Amen. Father, we thank you for bringing us together today and uh, through the your word, which guides us and instructs us and seeing deeper than just the surface level of the, the action recorded in your word to try to understand more deeply why things happened and even where they happened. And we are grateful, Father, for bringing to our attention the work of Dr. Heiser so many years ago has helped to open the Bible to us and, and makes it come alive where we can see now that there are reasons for the difficult passages like the death of Utsa, understanding that this was a, uh, because of disrespect for your instructions and the lack of reverence that is so evident among the body of Christ even to this day. People who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, but don't approach you, Father, with the awe and wonder 
that comes with approaching the one who spoke all things into creation. Lord, may we never lose that sense of wonder, that sense of awe, that sense of respect. Lord, we pray for the people of Turkey and Syria in the regions hit by this earthquake. We pray for the first responders, those who've traveled there to search and rescue survivors. We pray for those whose lives have been irrevocably changed by the event of this past Monday. The tragedy that has afflicted that region is beyond our understanding and difficult for us to understand why things happen in this world. We know, Lord, that many things in this world take place because sin and death entered in with the rebellion of Adam and Eve. Lord, we pray that through the miracles that are being witnessed there, through the grace and love that is shown from those who have just traveled there to be of help, that your glory and your love will be made manifest and made known to those who do not yet know. Salvation, which comes only through you. So Lord, we pray for a tender heart when it comes to uh, the afflictions of those who are not like us, those who live in other parts of the world. And we pray for your spirit to guide us as we look for ways to be of help. We pray for your blessing, Father, especially for those, again, working in those hard-hit regions, those who are ministering to the downtrodden and oppressed, those who are ministering in areas where the gospel is forbidden. We pray for your divine protection, for your encouragement, and for your providence. Father, we thank you for the way you have blessed us. May we honor and glorify you in all of our thoughts, words, and deeds this day and every day. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, By the way, Tuesday is also Mike Kaiser's birthday. That is correct. Mike will turn 60 years old on Tuesday. I know. So be praying for him that day. Amen. As you do every day. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org.